kind of in a minefield of rain right now. So there's rain there in there, there, and then a big patch of rain there, and it's all upwind of me. <laughs> well, the wind totally died, and somehow I can only make a knot and a half of motoring, and I have seven and a half miles to go. As promised, I am including World War II history in my cruising of the Solomon Islands. All right, the sun just set and I have hove to because I am just going way too fast, even with only a triple reefed main up. But it is so rolly on my boat when I heave to. I remember this when I left French Polynesia and I was waiting out some weather uh, and I hove to for 24 hours and it was just insanely rolly. Um, I don't know how it is on other boats, but on mine it kind of sucks, but it's only for about four hours just to kill some time because I don't want to get in uh, before sunrise and I'd also love to get some good sleep tonight. Okay, so as promised, I am including World War II history in my cruising of the Solomon Islands and, you know, honestly, it's pretty hard to overlook because once I got past Lata, my first island, which had basically no significance to World War II, um, many of the anchorages that I went to had wrecks or like planes in the jungle uh, or pieces of shrapnel left over from the war so it's pretty much something that is just part of the landscape of the Solomons now and when I was in the Solomon Islands I didn't have a sim card and I had very limited access to internet so I wasn't really able to do any research um, I did talk to people about their own memories of the war, but it's so many generations removed in the Solomons right now that the only story I heard, which I'll tell you guys in the relevant episode, was from a chief who, it was a story about his grandfather when he was a little boy and the chief was an older gentleman himself. So um, it wasn't really something that I brought up with the people that I met because it just felt kind of dark. Um, so I've done some research online to share with you guys because as I started looking into it, I got a lot of questions, which I'm sure you have too. But first I want to give a little bit of a background on World War II and how the Solomon Islands were a part of it. Uh, for those of you who already know, it's very short. And for those of you who don't, it's just like a very brief, very brief uh, background of everything, just to put it all into context. <laughs> So the U.S. involvement with the war in the Pacific kind of formalized when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Japan's goal was to make a defensive buffer against attack from the United States and its allies, and this was one of the first steps in Japan's attempt at mastery over East Asia and the Southwest Pacific. At first, Japan had the upper hand in the Pacific, but the tables really started to turn with the goings-on at Guadalcanal. Uh, Guadalcanal is the island that I'm sailing towards right now. I'm going to this very reefy bit that probably had nothing to do with the actual battle itself, but further north along the island, this is where I'm sure a lot of you remember hearing this, learning about the war, um, and this is one of the most significant islands in the Solomons for involvement, and it's pretty interesting. So... On July 6, 1942, the Japanese moved a force consisting of troops and laborers to Guadalcanal in the Solomon Islands and began constructing an airfield. The Allies, which included US, UK, Australia, New Zealand, etc., recognized that having control of the airstrip in Guadalcanal was sort of one of the keys to controlling a lot of the Solomons, which in turn was the key to uh, the Pacific control. The Battle of Guadalcanal was one of the first prolonged campaigns in the Pacific. The U.S. Navy initially suffered such high personnel losses during the campaign that for a couple years it refused to publicly release total casualty figures. However, um, as more U.S. forces were continued to be dispatched, they eventually started to get the upper hand and began to overwhelm the Japanese. And as the campaign wore on, the Japanese started to lose irreplaceable units while the Americans were rapidly replacing and even augmenting forces. They just had more manpower. 
In the initial assault on Guadalcanal, Allied warships laid down heavy barrages to screen the approach of troop transports and carrier-based planes. Landing craft took the Marines ashore at key points throughout the islands, and the Marines rapidly secured a beachhead on Guadalcanal and captured the almost complete airstrip that would later be known as Henderson Field. They also seized the smaller islands of Tulagi, Gavutu, and Tanambogo, and thus opened up supply and communication routes between the U.S. Australia and New Zealand. There's this channel that runs through the islands in the Solomons in this area that I sailed through on Gek. And reading all of this, I realized that I think this is why these islands were the key ones to have control of, because they're all pretty close together. And if you had a base in any one of these points, it would be pretty easy to defend that passage um, from ships especially. Almost as soon as the U.S. Marines landed on Guadalcanal and took over from Japan, Japanese commanders began making preparations for retaking the island. There were three major land battles, seven large naval battles, and continual, almost daily aerial battles, uh, which culminated in the decisive naval battle of Guadalcanal in early November. This was the last attempt from Japanese troops to retake Guadalcanal, and in December, the Japanese abandoned their efforts to retake Guadalcanal and evacuated their remaining forces. Uh, the Japanese lost a total of 24,000 men in the Battle of Guadalcanal, while the Americans had 1,600 killed, 4,200 wounded, and several thousand dead from malaria and other tropical diseases. Malaria um, is something that, <laughs> as cruisers in the now, everyone was thinking about. Some people were on malaria meds, some people weren't. I chose not to take them because they seem pretty gnarly, and I have been out of the Solomons now for a couple months, no malaria, so I think I got away free. But I can see how without bug spray and without malaria meds, that would have been pretty gnarly in itself. So the Japanese lost two battleships, four cruisers, one light carrier, 11 destroyers, and six submarines, while the Americans lost eight cruisers, two heavy carriers, and 14 destroyers. Okay, so the part that I'm particularly interested in is how these battles affected the Solomon Islanders and their lives, which, you know, they're just living innocently in their beautiful houses on the beach, fishing for their food, growing crops, and then all of a sudden the worst parts of the Western world just swing in at them and they're suddenly in the middle of this gruesome war. So I did some research and I actually found some pretty interesting articles that were written about the Solomon Islanders' involvement in the war and how it affected them. Um, and I guess one of the most pervasive ways that they're still affected is that there are still unexploded ordinances. And a couple years ago in Honiara, which is the capital of Guadalcanal, there was one that exploded. Um, there was a charity event and an ordinance exploded and it killed one person and injured three. And apparently in new construction and development, this is still a problem. Uh, allied forces, which aren't allied forces anymore, I guess, but US, Australia, New Zealand, Japan have all come into the Solomons and done some efforts to clear out these unexploded ordinances. But I think it's just one of those things that's really hard <laughs> to get rid of them all. Um, and I read a lot of information from different sides and people saying there hasn't been enough effort some people saying it's like a pretty impossible task so i don't really know what the answer is i'm just telling you the facts um but i found one article written by david welchman g-e-g-e-o is his last name um and he conducted interviews in the 80s, which was only about 40 years after the war. So he was able to interview some people who had been in it, and then people who were the children of people who had been in it. And he's got some first-hand accounts and some really interesting information uh, just specifically concerning the Solomon Islanders. So um, I'll put a link to the article in the description below if you want to read the whole thing, but I just pulled some quotes from him. I'm going to read to you. So he starts the article by quoting two of the men, Solomon Islanders, who were in the war. Um, so the first one is a man named Isaac Gafu, and he says, The war was very intense. Evenings, mornings, and nights, we were dumbfounded by everything that was happening. Guns and bombs were constantly exploding. We lived in constant fear.
And then the other quote that he has is from George Mailalo, and he says, You would see blue flames from the bombs dropped and shells fired. Day and night was just like that. And the ships at sea would also fire bullets like rain. Hey, I really don't even know how to describe it. So um, what... I'm just going to call him David because I can't pronounce his last name. What David, the article writer, is saying, uh, begins by saying, quote, um, most Solomon Islanders knew very little about the outside world prior to World War II, and their experiences with Europeans were largely limited to the British, Australian, and New Zealanders who were coconut plantation owners, missionaries, teachers, or colonial officers. After the U.S. took control of Guadalcanal from Japan, they employed about 800 Solomon Islanders as policemen, scouts, and coast watchers. A few were also trained as soldiers and later fought in Bougainville. The labor corps consisting of Solomon Islanders was essential to the Allied war effort because it freed American soldiers to concentrate on fighting and therefore played a role in victory over the Japanese. He goes on to say that the Solomon Islanders really had no idea what they were actually signing up for when they agreed to help with the war. You know, they had a lot of their own tribal wars, which were very different because it was with way fewer people and without modern weapons. And so when they went into these battles with ships and automatic guns, they were just just like <laughs> completely dumbfounded by not only the sheer number of lives lost, which was in the thousands, whereas all they would usually see was in the hundreds, but also just the the equipment that people were using to kill each other. Um, they just were completely taken by surprise. The other way that they were really affected was um, the relocation of vast numbers of men. So in their own tribal wars, obviously men would go off to fight against the other tribes, but it was smaller scale. There wouldn't be as many men who would leave the community, and usually they had a little bit more warning, like they would make a plan and they would go attack. And in this case, the war was kind of forced on them, and all of a sudden, hundreds of men were leaving their villages, and this was leaving holes in their own internal hierarchy and power structures that were difficult to fill because they just, this had never happened before. They just didn't have enough people to be like the chief and all the advisors. Um, the other thing is that British forces. Um, in particular, David talks about this one island called Malay, Malaita. Uh, they evacuated all the coastal villages of the area just one night. They were like, all right, you guys have to leave. There's going to be some sort of a battle. Uh, so David says that, um, where'd he go? He said, people still talk about how women pulled their sleeping children from bed and fled into the forest with them and how they spent the rest of the night laboring to erect shelters in mosquito-infested swampy areas using the dim light from burning dried bamboo and coconut leaves. For many months, people were forced to live in the bush without fires at night because of the fear that the Japanese would locate their settlements. And um, one of the worst things about not having fires is that um, this is something that I've noticed in French Polynesia, Vanuatu, Solomon Islands. They build smoky fires to be downwind of so that the mosquitoes don't get them. So anyway, uh, as I was researching this and looking at the photos, I couldn't help but put myself on these beautiful beaches that I saw in like seeing the people and the children and the dugout canoes and the palm trees in the sand and think what a strange backdrop for such a gruesome war and you know the way that people are living in the Solomons even now I really don't think their way of life has changed that much you know I spent my entire time in the Solomons uh, without ever seeing an ATM not until I left and I was in the very last town that I was able to take out cash um, there were no roads it was just villages on the beach with dirt paths and I was trading for whatever they were growing in their particular village or whatever they'd caught um, and their lives were just very peaceful very simple um, and even the idea of a cruise ship full of innocent cruise ship people landing in one of these villages and walking around would have been such a culture shock for them. So anyway, it's pretty mind-blowing to think about. Um, and I hope this gives you some context for what these people went through. Anyway, um, back to sailing. <laughs> I have about 10 miles of being hove to to go and then I'll unheave to and take my luck with hopefully not going too fast. There's got to be a current or something because um, I've just been making such good speed this trip and there's no way I can be going four knots downwind with just a triple reefed main in about 
15 knots of wind, it just doesn't seem possible without some current helping me. Which normally I'd be happy about, but in this case, really don't. <laughs> Third morning, so it started raining around 3 a.m. and it really poured for about an hour. I'd already been up for two hours because Uhuru was passing me and I realized I can either get in at sunrise uh, and just be completely toast the whole day because I'm so tired, or I can severely reduce sail, sort of heave pseudo heave to and sleep and then when I wake up, take the sails back out and get in slightly later, but who cares. So that's what I did. I got up at seven. I uh, unreefed the main, I raised the headsail, and now I have about 10 miles to go to get to the entrance of the pass. Um, it looks like it's gonna be kind of a, a nasty day. There's a huge gray cloud behind me and it's sort of, I don't know, icky, which I'm used to. But now that I've had five days of sun, I'm like, no, I want the sun. I don't wanna get in in the rain in a reefy anchorage where I'm anchoring in a really sketchy place that I'm not even sure I can anchor in. <coughs> but anyway, it seems like that's how it's gonna be. So at least I had a little bit of sun when I had it, I guess. I'm kind of in a minefield of rain right now. So there's rain there, bink bink. And then there's rain there and there, and then a big patch of rain there. And it's all upwind of me. <laughs> So I'm pretty much guaranteed to get wet. Definitely by that one, I've been watching it and it's heading straight towards me. Well, it's really pretty for the GoPro. I guess if you're sitting in your living room watching this on the screen, you're like, oh, the nature is beautiful. But if you're me, <laughs> you hate it. I'm just kidding. All right, so what do I have in the rain? Well, it's really hot now, so I don't think I want a rain jacket. So what I've done is set out, hang on, I just need to help the wind rain. It's really hard steering this morning. I'm kind of stuck on the helm. The wind is super gusty, uh, and the course just isn't. Uh, <laughs> so I have my waterproof case for my phone, a one-piece swimsuit, and a sun shirt, and I think that's all I'm going to need. Um, I don't think I'm going to want an actual rain jacket, because I think it's just going to be too hot. And it seems like they're all pretty isolated showers. Although that dark patch is really scary behind me, I don't like the looks of that at all. And I'm worried that it's gonna be there when I'm trying to anchor. Um, I'll show you guys what I'm trying to do and then you'll understand why I'm apprehensive about this. So, it's just really, really hard for the wind vane right now. Um, so I'm going in here to this reefy area, which is why it would be so lovely if it was sunny. And I'm gonna anchor here in this spot. It says 10 meters, but what I really do when I'm approaching stuff like this is I don't trust Navionics. Instead, I use this app called Offline Maps. And you can see all of this stuff. And then I'm going in it's here and you can see I've made these purple lines and these are the places where I could drop my anchor with enough swing room to not hit this coral or this looks like a shallow patch here <clears throat> and I did download this in really high resolution but it's deleted itself which is what this app does sometimes um but you can see here there's a patch of coral which hopefully I'll be able to swing over but I just don't want my anchor to be on it but then I can anchor a little further this way because over here it looks like it gets really shallow but it's a very tiny gap. Oh my god. I just can't do anything. <laughs> it's like good for 30 seconds. And if I adjust the wind vane, it just rounds up in the other direction. Anyway. Um, so it's going to be a little bit tricky. I think Uhura is going to anchor out here. And with this blue color, it's hard to tell how deep it actually is. I'm guessing 40 to 50 feet, which isn't ideal for me either. So now I've rounded up too high. Anyway, um, that's about all I can do for now. I think I just have to stay on the helm and uh, try to keep this boat going in a straight line. It's just really shit weather this morning. And <laughs> this is how all of my passages have been for the past couple months. So I was really gifted with quite a treat to have those two and a half really lovely days. But now I'm just back to really hard wind, rainy, cloudy, bad viz, not fun. 
And I don't like it. I don't like it. <laughs> well, the wind totally died and somehow I can only make a knot and a half of motoring and I have seven and a half miles to go. And I'm trying so hard not to be bummed because it has been a beautiful trip and the first two and a half days were just magical and amazing and it made me remember why I loved sailing but there's something very very frustrating about being seven and a half miles from the anchorage and knowing it's going to take me about four hours to get there um, and knowing that my engine is pissing oil I don't have enough to get through the Solomons it's a f***ing waste of oil to be motoring this slowly just to accomplish so little. I can't just sit and wait for the wind to come back for two reasons. One, I'm really close to the reef and I'm on a lee shore and all that would happen is that I would just slowly drift up onto the reef and two, I need to get in before it gets dark. This was the whole reason <laughs> that I slowed myself down last night and the reason why I woke up with 15 miles to go was that I was like, I'm just gonna let myself sleep and I can sail the 15 miles tomorrow morning. It should only take me about three or four hours, no big deal. Then I'll be rested, I'll get in around noon or earlier, I'll have the rest of the day, and then to have the whole thing just go awry is really, really frustrating. Mostly it's the whole motoring slowly thing. I'm waiting for the wind to fill in, but I'm kind of surrounded by squalls, which means that probably at some point the wind will fill in, but it's gonna come with a lot of rain and shitty viz. Uh, but at this point I'd almost rather have that than this. Anyway, it's temporarily sunny, but there's squalls all along the horizon. And now that I'm done complaining, <laughs> I'm gonna put on some music. I'm gonna try to lean into it. It's a nice day, it's calm, it's sort of sunny-ish at the moment. Um, you know, nothing has gone wrong. It just might be that it takes me the entire day to go 15 miles, which if I was in a canoe, like an outrigger canoe, no, this wouldn't take me all day to go 15 miles in a canoe. Maybe in my rowboat. If I was in my rowboat, I would not be happy right now. I would be way less happy than I am in this boat. Yep, <laughs> that's what I'm going with. What I'm hoping is that there's some weird counter current that's causing me to go a knot and a half, because usually I motor at about three knots, and that maybe I'm just getting around corner or maybe it's a incoming or outgoing tide or something and my hope is that once I get out of this patch albeit very slowly the current will either stop or change direction and I'll be able to go a normal speed one and a half knots is a very demoralizing speed to be going okay at this point my GoPro battery died so I, and I was just so fed up and tired that I didn't replace the battery so I didn't film coming in. Um, but basically what happened was that there was a really nasty counter current that was just working really hard against me. Uh, and after a couple hours of moving at about a knot I finally broke free of it. The rain that I thought was going to come never came, it got sunny, ended up being really beautiful uh, and I'm really excited to tell you guys about this bay and my experiences there because it is a wild and beautiful place and really my first taste of what the remote remote Solomon Islands were like. Thanks for watching this week's video. I know it's very different um, and I don't know every time I try something different I always am nervous that it's not gonna go over well um, but I put so much work into <laughs> researching um, and trying to get everything as absolutely accurate as possible. I looked at multiple sources for everything that I tell you. I know that a lot of you guys um, are in the Navy or ex-Navy or ex-military and I'm sure that you all know so much about all this stuff and so I wanted to really make sure that I got everything right. Um, so a ton of research, a ton of um, looking into finding historical photos of the actual events and man like this episode probably took me three times as long to edit as any other one but it was really fun i learned a ton in the process um so let me know in the comments uh what you thought of it and if you would like to see more 
or less of this sort of thing. I think Guadalcanal is like one of the most significant islands to World War II in the Solomons, so this is probably the most information that I'll have to share. Uh, I think all the other islands played way more minor roles uh, in the war. So even if you want as much information, you might not get it. Uh, but yeah, I'm just curious to see how you guys liked this, because I haven't really done it before. Um, that being said, next week's episode is back to how it normally is. There's a lot of beautiful drone footage. Uh, actually, actually, so <laughs> I left Gek for three months, and I'm here in Indonesia on Uhuru. And what I forgot to do was to take the SD card out of my drone and bring it with me. So all of the drone footage is in Australia on my boat. But luckily, I have made some friends and they are going to get, they're going to go onto my boat and they're going to find my drone and they're going to take the SD card out of it and they're going to upload it for me. So a huge thank you to them. I'll do more proper thank you in the next episode um, when I have the actual footage. Maybe get them to take some photos of them doing it because it's super amazing. Thank you guys in advance. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so anyway, anyway, nervous about this one. Excited to hear what you have to say. Please only comment if you have nice things to say. I'm just kidding. Say whatever you want. Thank you, Tish, for reminding me when it's time to do another edit, keeping me on task, making sure I get these videos out to you guys on time. Um, thank you to my patrons who are supporting me and making this trip possible. Um, right now on Patreon, we're doing a really fun journey where I am going back to my roots, uh, looking back at some of my first footage that I filmed when I was just leaving on my trip before I left, um, footage of before I even hauled out my boat and overhauled it, uh, and I'm just sort of reminiscing on how things have changed since then, and where, like, every video I put out, I ask them what they want to see more of and what they want to see less of, and it's like a fun little, uh, recap of a then and now sort of thing. So if you'd like to become a patron and have access to all of that stuff, and also support me, uh, my Patreon is patreon.com slash wintippy for one-time donations. If you don't want to do the Patreon thing, I have a PayPal, paypal.me slash wintippy. And merchandise, also all of this in links in the description below. I think that is all. Thank you for watching. I will see you patrons next week with another throwback snack. And for all of y'all on YouTube, I'll see you uh, in two weeks with another full-length episode.